What's up, peers, and welcome to join the WasabiCast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today we're continuing down our dive into what Wasabi Wallet 2.0 is all about. And I'm sitting down with David Molnard, CTO of CK Snacks Company and a longtime and prolific contributor to the Wasabi Wallet software project. David, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank you for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious uh, because we've been working quite a long time now on Wasabi 2.0, uh, but maybe let's recap. Uh, in, in your opinion, like what was 1.0 all about and what was the strength and weaknesses of our first attempt? <laughs> okay, so what was 1.0 all about? It was like a dream came true, right? It's a bit ideal maybe to say this, but actually this is what it is and i think adam uh, was speaking about this in the previous episode that there was a huge try and fail try and improve uh, time period before actually wasabi 1.2 um, born um, i don't want to go into very historical because i am not uh, I, I don't know the exact details, but I know Adam was working on it for six years before 1.2 came out. Uh, so basically, that's why I'm saying maybe, uh, Wasabi 1.2 was Adam's uh, vision uh, materialized in a software, right? And I think his pri uh, prior intention was to really bring privacy to to Bitcoin. Yeah, very good points, right? Wasabi didn't come out of a vacuum. Uh, there's a long history uh, of Bitcoin privacy before, but I think Wasabi made a, a great effort to make it the default uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, so wh where do you think that Wasabi 1.0 specifically succeeded when it comes in terms to pr delivering a private wallet experience to users? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, so it's it's my perspective, right? So um, at that time, there wasn't any wallet or any really trustless solution for CoinJoin, except except Join Market, and uh, also there was this uh, shared coin uh, stuff before um, that was kind of de-anonymized. Anyway, later on, I heard news that it wasn't de-anonymized as much as it was said. But anyway, this uh, event there was bringing down uh, that service as well. So it was join market and and basically nothing else. And and I think the timing was very good because. Um, Adam just just go very focused way to to release uh, 1.2, even though it has very many constraints in it. For example, the biggest one was the 0 0.1 minimum denomination, which wasn't seem to be a big constraint at that time because uh, Bitcoin was uh, three thousand uh, dollar, and and that means 0 0.1 was only just only uh, three hundred dollars, right? And uh, for example, you, we, we, he had to build that in because of the how how Wasabi one point two high zero link was designed. Uh, so that was, for example, one constraint. But what was the big thing in Wasabi? And in my perspective, it was very easy to use adam was always and we were always thinking about and also i have to mention dan wamsley and lucas ontivero right that they are the 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 tri triumvirate first they they brought the first release into life and i just joined right on the day of the release uh, so um uh, so what was the, the main thing? The main thing was that they were always talking about one click features and uh, simplify down that even 
someone who doesn't have professional experience with any of the coin join and UTXOs and uh, you know deep insights uh, with with these phenomenons can just go download the wallet receive some money and make a coin join so that was one very very strong uh, intention there to make it as easy to use as possible without over complicating the things that was one thing of course uh, and i did not mention that before privacy right and and security was like standard uh, requirements in the software so that's why i didn't mention it because join market was also something like privacy bringing privacy and security but uh, i never tried it actually but uh, i heard it it's uh, it was something like a, a console a command line stuff at that time so Wasabi was the first, was the first UI interface uh, made it kind of very basic uh, UI interface where you can just click and, and coin join. I think that was the key success. The key success there, uh, if we are talking about the software and, and there are many other uh, um, aspects of the success there which is not exactly related to the software itself but for example uh, um, articles and uh, taking part in different kind of uh, um, conferences and uh, the trust that we that uh, adam gained by the users because he was very directly reachable by anyone and uh, they, he gave honest answers, even if, if we fail sometimes, then we put out what happened, why it was happened, like a vulnerability report. So these honest and very transparent um, behavior of the company and the people in the company is also contributed a lot, I think, into that Wasabi became a trust uh, a trustworthy uh, software and let's say company. Yeah, yeah, those are all really good points, right? And it, I find it interesting that Adam was looking for a way to to do uh, to solve Bitcoin privacy on the blockchain layer, and then he found CoinJoin and and then implemented that. But in that research period, he found out that well, it doesn't matter if you have perfect privacy on the blockchain layer if you're still using your clearnet ip address uh and uh, uh you know send your xpub to all other places uh this so you need to have a good network level privacy and and synchronization privacy if you want to have any chance of having a good on-chain level privacy right and um so uh, then with wasabi 1.0 even though the original goal was to get a great coin join implementation um arguably the coin join implementation was uh, still the uh, like that part that w was far from optimal right but contrarily the tor integration and the block filter synchronization uh, were uh, great leaps forward in terms of network level and synchronization privacy and so uh, this just shows that we really have to build the foundations out strong before we can even think about stuff like blockchain level privacy yes absolutely and regarding that one for example if you think about it that someone could say that use some kind of operating system that has a built tor in it right and just download wasabi there and use it but actually this would reduce the number of users huge hugely right and, and greatly and and that was the the other thing that we did not cutting corners there it was that even if it is very hard we try to do this very simple uh, 
installation for the software, which is working out of the box. Of course, we had many problems and we still have uh, operating system or some specific settings where the software cannot just make these automatic uh, settings there. But, but on, I don't know, it's just a number, but 90 or 95% or maybe more, you just install Wasabi and it will just include Tor itself. You don't need to, you don't need to download or install a package additionally. No, it's just built in. It's there and it's working. So these kind of non-compromising behavior was that the, the, there are some principiums there, right? We, and, and we don't want to make compromises there. And, and that, that's the, that's why Wasabi is here. I think that's a very important thing to mention. And, and this is leads to what you are saying that even if you would implement coin join and the protocol, it would make no sense because on network layer, there are many nodes, super nodes. Those are operated by, by the surveillance and it, it just, very simple. If your wallet goes there and just grab one node randomly, which might can be a surveilled node and just asking all the transaction from the same node, then it just doxing all the information about your wallet and the wallet cluster is already there for, for any kind of, uh, investigation or whatever surveillance. So, he, he, so we, yes, that's, that's the point. No compromises. If there Wasabi would do coin join, then it must have a blockchain level privacy and a network level privacy. And if this cannot be satisfied, then we are out of the business and we can go to, I don't know, gardening or somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And right, th these are very hard constraints, hard limits that we set ourselves. And that makes it a whole lot more difficult, right? Not just to research and develop this type of software, but also the cost of using it, right? If you would just, you know, use, Tor makes everything slower. So if you just use ClearNet IP, you will load the wallet much faster. Same with block filters, right? Every user pays with time here to download a lot of data and then synchronize that data. Um, uh, so th this is... Um, uh, like, what do you think about the, the level of cost that is acceptable here? You know, like, uh, I, and I'm speaking, for example, if we have a very large wallet file, even right now in Wasabi, this can take hours to synchronize, um, maybe even days or weeks <laughs> in, in the worst case. So uh, how far can we go with being that stingent on our principles of privacy? Is this a question or, <laughs> or a, a statement? It depends. But... I think the point is that in Wasabi, we are always trying to make a consensus here, but uh, sometimes if they want bump to a principle, which is like privacy uh, is, is a very hard principle here, then immediately there is a, how to say a stop that we are saying that, yes, this is how, this is the best what we can do now, but we are not sacrificing privacy. For example, you know, the, the most easiest way to load the wallet is that there is a centralized central server somewhere and just it, it will would deliver the, the balance for your wallet and, and the transactions, those are included in, in one second. But, uh, and it's very convenient and many users asking that why it is so, so slow. But even in that way, even on those feature requests, we still, uh, and, and try to describe what, how this is working, why this is it this way. So if we bump into uh, a principle that is associated with Wasabi, for example, privacy, and security as well. And there are many more, but privacy is the, the, the most prior one. Then we are saying no to that feature. 
request, even for ourselves, because as you mentioned, these kind of uh, this principle brings us a lot of complication. A lot of I I would, you know, if privacy wouldn't be important, and we just like as I mentioned, I would just prepare everything in the back end and just deliver it to the wallet. It's very simple. We won't have delay problems. I don't need to work for weeks to stabilize store and find out different kind of walkarounds that how you can even make it um, uh, stable or reliable. But <laughs> okay, one thing I like to do it because I like these kind of mysteries and investigations, and I think uh, many other people in this in the company is like that. Uh, that's the other one. The, the the other thing would be that I would I would fail basically if we would ever cut that cut that uh, that edge, cutting that corner. And yes, that's I think that's the 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 level is um, flexible until a point when it hurts one of the principles. And even if it hurts just a small, then we are still saying no to that feature. So basically, that's that's the one. Sometimes this brings tension, but uh, this has a price, right? This is what we are talking about right now. That sometimes this is hard, even for us, for the users. But uh, yes. That's the way it is. That's how we can preserve Wasabi essential. Uh, what what's essential essential in Wasabi? And and as you say, right? This uh, people uh, trust the the reputation and that mindset or motto uh, of Wasabi uh, with well their financial privacy, which is a big part of their life. Uh, and you know when. Uh, when it is known that we have these staunch principles where we don't back down off, then that gives a whole bunch more uh, well reputation and trust that the user can rely upon that, right? And then this way we almost kind of filter out a certain group of potential users, right? those who are privacy conscious, uh, and uh, that they are usually aware that that privacy comes at a price, right? In, in this specific case, just waiting. Uh, and... I, I hope that there will be more tolerant towards that, right? So, um, and I like what you said that at some point we just have to ship it um, and, and be honest about uh, this is far from perfect, but it's as good as we got right now. Uh, and hopefully it will help you already, right? But be aware it comes at a cost, uh, mainly of you waiting. Uh, and that doesn't mean though that we stop working, right? Uh, on improving the problem and uh, even though we have those very hard constraints uh, to still make some small marginal improvements wherever we can. And, and we saw that, I think, during the life cycle of 1.0, right? The, the actual 1.0 release was, well, it worked, but <laughs> barely in many extents. Uh, and, you know, if you would have had large wallet files or something and trying to synchronize that with the, that old wallet, probably would have taken ages, right? But then I remember numerous times where we have, for example, increased the, the speed of synchronization by massive factors of like, you know, 20x or even 75x. Uh, and that just shows that having these limits is hard and it, it will take a long time to um, build something that is very usable and valuable within this limit, but it's, it's definitely not impossible. And so th this is a, a great mindset to actually build high quality software. Yes. And actually, if you grab this loading example, for example, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we could elaborate on, on that more. But the other aspect what I uh, encountered here, and, and I I'm, I'm already made it to my, uh, myself as well, that we try to step back every time in a way to have a, a, a bigger vision of that what we are doing in the software and 
if there is a, a bigger goal that a huge improvement in privacy, in that case, we prioritize that one. So for example, when we are talking about loading time of the wallet, that is important for the users, but it's, it's a secondary uh, feature compared to any other kind of privacy improvement. And for example, we could sit on VV1 and further increase, uh, further develop it to being more and more convenient to use, to having all the features those are requested. But uh, in that case, we would just sit down there and, and just living there in that let's say it's, so it's it's not bringing a new i i don't like the word innovation because it's very used by everyone but really bringing some innovation to to the software so we said that no yes wallet loading time is a lot sometimes uh, but uh, is that really important to improve that is that really worth to spend one month on that or we should research new coin join technologies like for example what we have in 2.0 and spend one year on that and going in in a manner to look to the future instead of trying to make something that will be obsolete sooner or later and this is also hard because uh, at least for me because sometimes i um, have this convenient conveniency that yes i just this is a masterpiece right vv1 and it's very stable and we just add another feature and you know you can do this for years and uh, rebuilding the software from let's say almost scratch is something that also sounds like a big adventure a challenge but also it will we we knew that it will take a lot of time and a lot of effort to to make it work but we decided to do it so that's also kind of part of wasabi that we are not looking back we are always looking uh, to the to the future and try to implement features and ids those are pointing to the future and not something that is convenient for us to do yeah but that's also such a difficult line to walk right because sure you could say always spend your time on uh, uh, developing that massive improvement this this huge innovation right that's one extreme. The other extreme is to uh, uh, let's make just small marginal fixes to what we got, uh, make what we have better, right? And if we do that often enough, it's going to lead to a big uh, innovation too, right? So there's there's these two sides. But where or how did you choose when to switch from one to the other? It depends on the people of the company. I would say. I, I feel that I am kind of a stabilizing person, person so I'm always uh, try focus on, on the that we have something and make it a bit more better. And uh, that's but, but I also understand that the other concept and why it is important. But I think everyone has the role, their, their role of the company uh, in this manner. And uh, we try to become a consensus. And uh, and and I, I saw that this is an important step to not uh, continue uh, VV1 in that way and to find, because there are limits there, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the main point that you are making something more perfect and better. But because it has a, a basis, a base basement, it cannot be became anything, right? Because 
it was standing on 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 solid uh, things that cannot be changed. For example, in Wasabi, there is the zero link protocol, which is a very, very solid concept, but it has its limitations. And saying that, okay, zero link has constraint, those are not uh, bringing privacy for everyone, for example. So we have to change that. So it is no matter how much time you spend on zero link, it will be never satisfies that goal. It's not a clear cut. You can make some mitigations and improvements, but at the end, you will have something which is kind of not too bad, right? It's, it's not good, but not too bad. And in that case, in that case, you have to decide. Start something new from scratch with risk, taking the risk, right? That's, that's one thing. Taking the risk, taking the, the load, the workload. And uh, we, we decided to do that, but not because to do something new. It was because we, we just encountered what is missing from VV1. Why? What do we want to? And this is what I mentioned earlier, that it's step back one, right? And look what, what happened in the last... I don't know, two years with VV1 and what's the, the, the most important. For example, when we released VV1 after three months, um, there was a huge conversation about that Wasabi is hard to use because even though we try to make it a one click and a very easy to use software, it was hard for the user still because the coin control, for example, because the buttons, the layout, how was it? It, it wasn't, wasn't designed in a way um, because there, there was no time for it, but it was hard to, hard to use. So that was one thing. The other thing was the 0 0.1, right? The, the minimum denomination. So these are very hard problems, which is cannot be just solved by patching the, the existing stuff there. And, and this is also hard to, to say this at that point, when you have a software, it's very well respected. It's a success, let's say, and you have to say it is not good enough. I have to do something else and replace major parts of the software. So it's kind of a self-reflection to us, which uh, we are constantly trying to make. And, and, and that's, that's the way I think we can improve. Yeah, right. And it, it again comes from, from a limit that we had in the past, right? This zero link protocol had design limitations uh, specifically that everyone had to have exactly the same denominations and you could not have that many of these different denominations and so um, however regardless at the time uh, zero link was the only denial of service protection mechanism for collaborative bitcoin transactions and right? that was still private uh, in, and anonymous for at least some uh, of the protocol right so this was as good as it got and since our highest principle was to protect user privacy we had to stay with that protocol, which had much more constrained limitations. And, and then that resulted in things like, well, now all of a sudden we have to have a coin list and manual coin control, because there are some coins that you receive that will be private, but there are other coins that are not private. And then now we have to differentiate between them. Uh, and uh, uh, this, you know, this then led to a clunky design and uh, very difficult problems to solve for the user. Like, which coins should I now actually spend? Right? Uh, uh, what are even coins? Most Bitcoin users don't even know that. And right? so that, that just, uh, because of these design constraints of Zerolink, we had to um, worsen the UX uh, in, in a lot of uh, degree because we just didn't know how to make a pretty UX that was still private given those constraints of Zerolink. Yes, and look, for example, the coin list stuff that the coin control stuff, it was kind of advertised or introduced as a, a very good feature in the software in VV1. You can find 
Uh, I was talking about it in conference. Adam was talking a lot about it. You made some videos how to use the coin control. So, and, and at some point, the highest priority was to educate people regarding the coin control because we believed privacy is impossible without coin control. So we were very engaged, let's say, with coin control. But after a while, uh, we saw that this software cannot just break through to different layers of Bitcoin users because of these kind of, um, I think it was, let's say, an, an, an illusion that we can, because it's not because the user don't understand it. It's because they, they have a different perspective of Bitcoin. They are not, not about coins and about technology and about UTX or Tor, these kind of things. They just in, in different business, let's say, right? So regarding this self-reflection, we said that coin control is something that, let's say Wasabi was one of the, the first software that was very, very engaged with coin control, like I mentioned before. And now in 2.0, we dropped it because we realized that in three years, uh, which was the, the VV one and, and it's still ongoing, but, uh, at that time we tried everything what we could, uh, regarding the coin control, but as I mentioned, it, it, it cannot break through on some, and, and we still getting that it's hard to use or even worse, people using it in a wrong way. Right. And they are losing privacy because of their wrong selection in the coin control, in the coin list. Um, that's another aspect of this. So even though we were very engaged with coin control, we saw that this is not the future. And this is the other aspect that I mentioned. This is not the future. Even if we cannot imagine it right now, how to do it, we have to do it. We have to work on it, how to, how to drop coin control in 2.0 or how to give another option for the users, at least to select, uh, to, sorry, to not facing that interface where you have a lot of coins, amounts, confirmations, um, you know, these kind of phenomenons, because this is a, a very uh, the rabbit hole, and it seems like we're not gonna make it to to make everyone understand what is that. And that's that's how Wasabi 2.0. Uh, by for, for the first look, you, you won't find the coin control there. And and it's a fight because even in a, in our group, there are different perspectives regarding this. But uh, of course, more or less, we, we try to go to a consensus. For example, there is a special key combination where you can still uh, see your coins, uh, but by default, you won't see the coin control itself because of these reasons. We, we don't want to get have another software which is hard to use. Yes, and uh, you know, just to to shed light of why we needed coin control uh, in the first place, which is what you have to ask yourself, right? We, we added it, and now everyone likes it. But why did we add it? What was the problem that we wanted to solve? Right? And this is that the user can control who might potentially know about his transactions when uh, when he's not spending private coin join outputs, right? So that that is the ultimate reason, right? To control who uh, are like to which previous transactions this current payment is going to be related to. Um, and, well, doing that with a coin list is is good, but even in Wasabi, that wasn't enough, right? Uh, that's why we had mandatory labels whenever you generated a receive address so that you knew who actually sent you that money so that then later, if you want to spend it without it having gone through a coin join, 
uh, then you know exactly who might potentially know that this is yours. And then you can make a much better educated decision about whether or not you're happy to, sh to reveal this information about yourself. Um, and now the big question is, can we get the same um, feedback from the user without actually having to burden him with uh, seeing a coin list, understanding what UTXOs are, and, and then to make the right decision of which of them to include in his transaction. And I think we've come up with a, a quite interesting solution, right, where we still have the mandatory labels uh, on, the, on the receive side, so we still know whoever knows about this uh, deposit into Wasabi, whoever made that. Um, and uh, now, uh, well, when you send a payment, uh, first you type in the destination that uh, you actually want to send it to, right? So uh, maybe let's say uh, this is David, right? So I'm, I'm writing David into the label of this transaction that I'm sending. Well, and now the wallet can go through and, and see, well, do we have any unmixed coins in the UTXO set of this wallet that has the label of David? Right? And if yes, well, then I might as well just use this transaction or this coin in the transaction. David already knows it's mine. So if I give it back to him, I'm not revealing any additional information about myself. Right? And uh, this is one of the nice tricks of how we can uh, solve one of the problems that uh, we are trying to solve with the coin list itself, but doing it so by asking the user a much more intuitive question and, uh, that gives us the preferences, for example, who has sent you that money and whom are you sending that money to now? And, and we use that then internally to make a proper coin selection for the user. Yes, thank you for this addition. I, I always, uh, I, I sometimes I, I don't think that someone might not use the Wasabi in advance so because i'm so deep inside the development that i forget to mention these uh, very basic and principal things so uh, thank you for doing that regarding this topic labels and and coin selection uh, i i need to mention that we will have a feature which is called auto coin join and uh, vv2 motto let's say uh, or saying is that privacy by default and the thing regarding coin join would be regarding coin selection would be that the user would have always enough private coins to make a transaction because and let's jump back to how to have private coins making coin joins right and if you, we jump back to VV1, what was happening there is that the user has some money. And then he went to a coin join. He would get back 0 0.1 and the toxic change. Why it is toxic? It is toxic because using subset sum analysis, it's easy to sometimes it's very easy to 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 figure out which is the change that is coming back to you just a very quick example you have five bitcoin one in on one input you go into the coin join you will get 0 0.1 and you will get back 4.9 if someone looks at the transaction on the blockchain it will, will be easy to find out which is your change. It won't be easy to find out which 0 0.1 is yours because there are 50 or 60 0 0.1s there in the transaction that that's your private coin. And, but you will get back the change, obviously. And in the next coin join, you can do another round and another 0 0.1 private coin you will get, but you will have another change of 4.8 so there were two problems here you will get 0.1s in your wallet the other thing you will have toxic change which you have to coin join in another round until it will consume your whole balance so at the end you will have a private 
coins in your wallet. And th these are two things. One, 0 0.1 is, a, is, is one denomination. And right now, it's let's say it's huge because it's, I don't know the exact exchange, but let's say it's $4,000. Uh, $4,000 is, is good for someone who is making big businesses, but for a regular user, it's a lot of money. So the, the first thing is, and, and when you try to send, then you will use this coin, this 0 0.1, because that's, that's what you have in your wallet. So you will use it as an input, send it to someone else, and here comes the label stuff that you mentioned, you type in that I'm sending this to Max. And so you will get the private coin and you will know about the change that I'm getting back from, from you. And here comes the, the, the paradox problem that that change is known by you. How can you, uh, let's say, dismiss the, the label on, your, on that coin? You have to do another coin join. So, the problem of the change is, is something very important to understand. That the change always, uh, or in these cases, uh, won't have privacy on it. So we, you have to earn the privacy on that coin again. And uh, the other thing is the 0 0.1, that it is a huge denomination. And it's only very homogene, right? Because you will only have 0 0.1 in your wallet. So your wallet look like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, if you are rich enough, and, and a lot of 0 0.1. And at the end, one small amount of change that you won't use when you are sending. So this is how your wallet would look like. Uh, and this is how it is working in, zero, in, the, in VV1. But if you compare to VV2, what's happening is that the wallet is trying to maintain 40 coins for you, which means that when you come with one coin uh, and, and you, you participate in one coin join, you will get back, this is not exact numbers and it depends on the users, but you will get back, let's say four or five coins there with different denominations. So your wallet will, will be much more colorful or variable amounts. So when you will try to send to someone else, the wallet will pick the, the most, the, 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 the composition of coins. The first thing that it won't generate a change, right? Because sometimes it can get an exact match and, uh, for example, Lucas made a research that, and, and that's why the 40 coins was some kind of a goal, because if the wallet has 40 coins, which is very well distributed enough regarding the amount, it is almost for sure that the software will find a combination that is producing very small change or not producing a change at all which is very good because you will get rid of the toxic change problem. And this is also true for the coin joins. The wallet will try to make a coin join in a way that you don't get back uh, a change. And so you don't need to mix. And if you are lucky enough, and this is something that we, we have to improve, but if you are lucky enough, the, after the first coin join, you will get a decent number of anonymity because you will get back five coins with four or five or ten anonymity set on it, anonymity score on it, and and, and that's something you can already use to send for to someone. And it's uh, if you are not. Uh, um, I don't know, someone who is uh, observed by, I don't know, six chain analysis company and you have a wire on your phone or something. So you are someone who is uh, everyday Bitcoin user. Then 
having those anonymity set is already giving you a, a good privacy for for personal users of course you can keep doing this and and get the the anonymity score th that you want but uh, you know when when you are in a hurry or you want to get something quick then this can be a solution for them because having no privacy is much worse than having some privacy right I, it's trivial but basically with 1.2 you you was not able to do this because if you take part in a coin join and there were i don't know 60 users then you immediately get 60 uh, anonymity score but some users and this was a support request that why do i need to have I, i'm i'm good with 20 but you were not able to do 20 anonymity score before because because this is how zero link works uh, it puts everyone on one denomination which is 0 0.1 and if there are 60 people then there will be 60 anonymity score there so this is how we v2 trying to deal with the, the minimum denomination the the problem that uh, there are only 0 0.1s in the wallet so you have to consolidate sometimes so that using privacy and there are many other privacy nuances there in vv2 you will have a variable amount of uh, amounts variable coins with variable amounts and the toxic change problem is mitigated as well and and that's how you even don't need to use the labeling system because the labeling system was another uh kind of questioned many times how is it working why is it there uh, that's another topic i i let you react reagate to this one uh, we can jump into that as well after this yeah no you really lined out uh one of those major benefits of wasabi 2.0 right and that's um to kind of separate that out a bit further right in in 1.0 we had well, one or later, maybe eight different standard denominations, uh, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, uh, 1.6, and so on. Um, but, uh, and these standard denominations were defined for every round, right? So in, in one round, the de minimum denomination was 0 0.1000, 0 0 0, and then the next round, it was 0 0.099999, right? Uh, because it kind of had to be reduced for the fees. Um, and, uh, with now with 2.0 we've flipped that on the head right we've we've created oh, i don't even know how many hundreds or thousands of different standard denominations between 5000 satoshis and something like 1200 bitcoin or something i think it is it is 64 64 now 64 different standard denominations are now possible and um i actually had a feeling it would have been even higher um but but, but in any case uh, there, uh, that now means that um, every output or almost every output in a coin join transaction will be one of those standard denominations. And, uh, however, that does not mean that there are multiple outputs with that exact amount of satoshis right, of the standard denomination. Right? So even though every output value is going to be one of those standard denominations, there might be some denominations that only have one anonymity set size. And, um, uh, however, the, the really, really cool benefit about us now making a much more deliberate choice of what are these standard denominations uh, is that uh, they are very easy to uh, add up to each other. So th this is a concept known as low hemming weights. Uh, and uh, basically, it just means that, uh, y you know, if you have a 0 0.1 and another 0 0.1, well, you can add a 0 0.2, right? So, and 0 0.2 is another standard denomination, just as 0 0.1 is, right? Uh, and, and this means that you can very nicely kind of um, move up and down uh, this denomination uh, uh, scale, and you can create outputs of the value, uh, whichever you choose, right? But because they are these low hamming weights, regardless of what your input amount is, you can decompose your out or that value of Satoshis down into very few outputs. You know, as David said, roughly between three and 
five or seven. Not even sure what the worst case is. Um, but this just means that even though there might only be a very small number of equal outputs uh, of that specific denomination, you still get a, a higher privacy as compared to the amount composition of 1.0, right? Because these were not low hamming weights, so they didn't easily add up. Yes, and as, as you as you mentioned regarding the denominations, that and, and this is what that we are trying to improve. That how how this is working. That basically everyone in in connection confirmation phase. Anyway, after the coin join is started, let's imagine it in the following way. I, I don't know how our audience is familiar with video games, but imagine there is a lobby and everybody is coming into the lobby and saying that, hey, I have, I have this coin and I want to coin join. And there is a time out there uh, when everyone is just, just gathering around in the lobby. Everybody is, is proving and showing that I have this amount of money. I want to coin join that one. And this is the input registration phase. So it's kind of, a, and why I mentioned the video game references, because there are many games when you are joining somewhere and basically it's actually called a lobby and uh, waiting until, I don't know, 60 gamers, players uh, gathered. And then after you can leave, right? At that phase, you can jump in, jump out, you can do whatever you want. But if the conditions are met, then the game is saying that, okay, this will start in five seconds, countdown. And after that point, you are in. So you cannot leave, you cannot, you can leave, but you will be banned, right? So there is a penalty there. And basically the, the progress is starting to, uh, to, 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 the progress is starting basically. And that's the connection confirmation phase that after everyone collected together and some conditions met, we are starting to construct the coin join itself, which is a, 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 a huge transaction. But the point is there that uh, at connection confirmation, everyone gets the inputs of the transaction. Those are, we, we don't know who, which input belongs to who, but you will get a list of amounts. Those are the amounts of the coins they, that will get into the coin join itself. And from those infor from that information, every client will try to figure out which denomination will be the most frequent one. And uh, of course, taking my uh, uh, balance into account, it will try to figure out which denomination worth to register to. And sometimes this estimation, this uh, guess is very good. So in that case, there will be, let's say, what is the good? What does it mean good? It means that you will get back five coins with slightly same that everyone, every coin will have some uh, anonymity score on it. And you will get back no change because there was, there was an exact decomposition uh, on your balance that you want to uh, participate with. And, and that's, that's a, a, an addition compared to VV1, another addition that uh, they, the clients try to make, let's say a consensus, but there is no communication, just only this uh, game, this guessing game uh, regarding the denominations and then they will try to register and uh, see what happens. And, and sometimes it's very good. Sometimes it's not, but I think that's something that we can improve. But basically that's, that's one, uh, basis of how to select the denominations. 
So the denomination is not uh, the standard denomination, the levels are predefined by the coordinator, but the actual denomination, those will be realized in a coin join itself, is actually made by the, the this consensus among the clients. So that's the that's the deal there. This is really interesting because it's uh, it again shows that we have constraints here, right? We want to reveal as little information about the user as possible, right? But think of the other extreme, right? So we have a, a couple of users, uh, and each of them would trust each other, right? And they would just share exactly which coins belong together, right? So not just saying this is one coin that I have; these are the four coins that I want to register, right? So you publicly attribute uh, exactly what your total wallet balance is in this specific coin join. So the sum of your inputs. And Sorry now if every interrupt. other user... In, mm -hmm. in VV1, we are talking about VV1. Uh, no, this is just how we could have done it in we, we, at the Wasabi 2.0, right? We, we, we could have went the way that every user publicly announces exactly the sum of all of his inputs in that specific round. And if every other user knows that, well, then we can make that decomposition uh, table a lot um, more accurate, right? Because we know exactly the wallet balance of a user, right? And then we can better deduce uh, how he's going to decompose that, right? But of course, the big problem here is then every user must tell every other user, uh, what's the sum of, of my money that I have here? And well, the question is, can we get a good enough result without having to reveal that information about the user? And, and this is what we ended up with in Wasabi 1.0. Uh, sorry, Wasabi 2.0, where, for example, you have three different coins that you want to register. One Bitcoin, two Bitcoin, and three Bitcoin, for example. Um, however, so you do not go into the lobby and just as one identity say, I have this one plus two plus three Bitcoin, uh, and I want to coin join all of them. Instead, you create a separate identity and you uh, communicate through a separate Tor stream uh, and just present one of your three coins uh, uh, it, uh, under this one identity. And then in parallel, you just create a new identity and walk into the same room wearing a different mask, uh, proposing your second coin. And then, and then a third identity appears proposing the third coin. And, and the main benefit is, you know, not even the other users or the coordinator knows that you're actually those three people providing these three different coins, right? That that's actually one entity owning all three of them. And... and um, well, but we, we, we did some simulations and actually figured out that even if we don't know which exact input pairs belong to any given user, uh, we can just assume uh, that everyone only like that everyone uh, every one coin is owned by a different user. Uh, and that's how we build our decomposition kind of frequency table, um, assuming that everyone only has one coin, right? But the end result is pretty good already, right? It's it's not perfect. It would be a lot better if we would know exactly which inputs belong to which user. Um, however, even if we don't have that information, the result is good enough. And so uh, this is another line where, where that we draw on the sand and say nobody should know which inputs uh, you consolidate here. And that's that's a very important aspect of 2.0 that we figured out to do it properly without having to reel that information about the user. Yes, that's a huge improvement there, and it's. Uh... Yes, that just to wrap wrap what you set up, uh, set, wrap up what you said that in VV1 you were able to register coins up to seven, but and this is another aspect. And I'm jumping back Wasabi um, principles uh, just a bit, and we will get back to this uh, input registration stuff that. We consider an advisory, even ourselves. So that means we are trying to construct the software in a way that even if we would have, we would be in evil on the coordinator side, the client would just not register or not sign or just yeah, so it, it would detect that if something is not right on the back end, then I won't take part in a coin join. I would just bail out, let's say. And and this is 
something easy, but doing this in a way that you are even not revealing information regarding yourself is very, very complex to do. For example, one major feature of the of every Wasabi software, this is true for 1.2 and 2.2 as well. We even ourselves cannot de-anonymize the coin join because the, there are some blinding uh, operations on the outputs in, in behind uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so that that's something very hard to do, and uh, and and this is true for 2.0 as well. So we can cannot interconnect the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and, and this is a very, very important stuff, very, very important feature. And it's not because that we are, uh, can we can be hacked, right? We, we saw many cases where big companies got hacked and all the user information uh, thrown out to the internet or, or there can be many things. So the, the safest thing is to not store any data of these kind of coin joins. Even more, it's not just about nuts to store. The thing here, the real feature here, is that we couldn't even know, even if we would like to know those, uh, those informations. And that's when we are saying trustless, we are generally speaking about that, that we handling ourselves as an advisory, uh, from the client side, which means that even we are handling the coordinator itself as an advisory. So we try to be a system. Those are, those are not giving any information that can harm the user privacy. We know nothing more than the blockchain, uh, would know. That would be the ideal state, right? We just only know what you, everyone can see on the blockchain and that's it. And in, in VV1, uh, this was true for the anonymity, for the, the coin join itself. But for example, uh, so we, we, we are not able to de-anonymize the coin joins. This is, uh, I think it's uh, something well known. But for example, if you check the, the input registration, you register one to seven input with the input registration request. It is very clear that if it is in one request, then if we would try to get that information, that means that we could be able to interconnect those inputs together, which is not a big privacy leak, because at the end, we don't know where, which denomination, which uh, output you will get, but still it's, it's a privacy information that the, the client, the VV1 Wasabi client is uh, giving to us because of the, the, the structure of the, the, the requests itself. The API is designed in that way. But in 2.0, you can do coin registration, as you mentioned. Every coin is a separate uh, request and Basically, the coordinator cannot interconnect those input, even the input, even in the, the input registration, we are not able to interconnect those inputs. And the point is here that this leads to, this has many consequences, right? The cons, first consequence is that you can consolidate your coins without revealing information with us. Right, I just take uh, one coin, this 0 0.1, this 0 0.3, this 0 0.4. In VV1, you would send this information, send these coins in one request, so the coordinator would, would be able to know that these coins belong together. But in VV2, though these inputs can be sent separately, so there is this was a slight privacy leak, as I mentioned, but even this 
privacy leak is not there anymore. And uh, this is very hard to do because of, uh, for example, the DOS attack. Uh, DOS attack prevention is much harder in this way because anyone can come with a small coin, then later uh, doesn't sign the coin join and it will just fail. Um, meaning that it will fail for everyone. And, uh, you know, with 0.1, it is not so feasible to do this on the long term because that's a lot of money. But now that you can register small amounts, you just bail out at the end and the coordinator can just, uh, ban that little small coin but if you have a lot of money or not so much but you have a lot of coins you can keep doing this for i don't know for a day and uh, pushing down the service for a day is not a not a dos protected service right so it's but uh, yeah anyway that's a uh, 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 stability and security important aspect but the thing is the privacy aspect again that you can consolidate without any privacy uh, privacy problem inside a coin join so that that's something uh, a improvement there yeah, and here again right the extra focus on keeping users privacy leads to way bigger problems uh, that are much more difficult to solve as the denial of service factor that you bring up Right, so uh, how can how can we deal with it? Uh, you know, where previously the attack cost at least 0.1 Bitcoin, now it costs 5,000 sats, uh, substantially less. Right, so were there any kind of mitigations done on the back end to hopefully counteract that new imbalance? <laughs> okay, so that's a... Uh, one thing is, for example, that in VV1, we let unconfirmed coins to register into the round and the problem here is that uh, what's the what's the advantage and the disadvantage the advantage is that you can do coin joins much quicker because you don't need to wait for the confirmation right you can just take part in one coin join you get the output of that coin join and you can immediately register that unconfirmed output into another coin join and basically build, uh, basically quickly having more privacy. On the other hand, this led to a problem where these coin join transactions basically chained up and nobody, uh, at least the miners, just didn't want to mine the transaction because it's a huge uh, data, right? Many bytes. So the, the, the cost is huge. And if the, the fee environment changed rapidly, then it wasn't feasible to mine those chains. And uh, when, when there was a, a fee bump there on the block, uh, on the Bitcoin network, uh, we get the problem that these transactions are just hanging there for a week and the user just, hey, this is not confirming and there was no way to improve because imagine that it was, the fee was a hundred dollar or something. So even if one user would say, okay, I try to try to bump the fee with uh, child pay for parent, uh, technique let's say so create another transaction on top of the unconfirmed your unconfirmed coins and let's say you you set it to i don't know five dollars or something that that's not much right it's not uh, really make sense to do it because the the transaction is huge and the fee is huge and basically one user cannot make a significant impact on that one so later on we changed to confirmed coins only at input registration and that also takes out the many of these edge cases many of these dos attack problems uh, from the round so that that was that was one kind of mitigation there of course we still have the the banning system that if if uh, 
uh, UTXO disrupting the round, and we will ban that for uh, it's configurable, but let's say for 10 hours. But from the records, we saw that on this side, the disruption mainly coming from network problems or just misusage of the software. For example, someone forget that they are part in a coin join, just put, put uh, close the laptop. And uh, so it was not an intentional DOS uh, attack, instead accidental and uh, it's coming from usage, usage of the software. Maybe the the attention was not brought, uh, yes, brought to the users that hey, then right now you are coin joining, so don't turn off your computer. And actually, we implemented some kind of shutdown prevention into this uh, VV2 as well uh, to to warn the users that you really should not. Uh, uh, over of your laptop right now because the coin join transaction is a critical phase. You should wait two more minutes until it finishes. Um, uh, so that regarding those protection, this is what we did. That now we are only accepting confirmed coins. We have the banning system there on the input side, and all of these improvements uh, to to mitigate the user user error, the, the behavior, user behavior, those led to, to coin join round disruption. I think that's it. And and we, we hope that and we agreed that this would be enough at the beginning, uh, because we assume honest users uh, on some level. At, at least this is what we experienced in VV1. So that's why. So it is not just assume but uh, it based on the uh, based on on the past yes and i think so far that strategy worked out decently well uh, i don't think that there were any major active attacks you know sure we experienced some failure but that was as you said usually just someone closing his laptop or much more likely tor uh, being very slow and, and cumbersome. Um, so uh, maybe you can speak a bit about how we improved Tor as well, because we use it a lot more heavily now. Right? Previously, let's say seven inputs uh, being consolidated, that's just one Tor identity. Uh, but now you have seven unique Tor identities running in parallel. Right? So presumably uh, that's a lot heavier use and hopefully not a lot more failure on the signing side. Okay, so just a couple of sentences regarding DOS attack because before we move forward to the, the next topic, that we, we got DOS attacks, but on different level. So it's, yeah, the attacker don't need to go down to the protocol level of the coin join. They just start to uh, uh, overwhelm, for example, one API request. But even that is not required. If you have a public IP address, and at that time we had, it was a luck that it, it wasn't uh, discovered by attackers, but after a while it was. And they just send, I don't know, SYN, syn request on TCP level. Uh, but I don't know, two millions in one second or something, and, and that's more than enough to to disrupt the service. So yeah, uh, those attacks should be mitigated on different level because it seems like it, it doesn't need to go into this this deep, right? So we should not try to mitigate problems and those attacks, those are not exist on that layer. So it's something like, it's like the wrench attack, right? <laughs> that you can buy, you can buy very sophisticated uh, hardware wallets, but at the end, if they attack you and your life is threatened, it doesn't matter what technology you are using. 
uh, right? Okay, there can be some solutions, of course, just uh, for the, the matter of the, the example, is that those attack coming from from network layer, not, not on, on coin join protocol level. Yes, and it's also about layers of defense. Right. Um, and we can have our gates open, so to say, during peacetime. Uh, but as soon as someone mounts an attack, uh, we can wrap up the protections, right? And, and close some gates and uh, increase some timeouts and put coins on ban lists or blacklists. You know, th uh, these things are all possible. However, if we would have them there all the time, um, it, it, it might be uh, a bit cumbersome to the user. Depends, of course, on what it is, right? But let's assume if you just shut down your laptop uh, or, or the Tor connection breaks in the background and you fail to sign a round and all of a sudden that coin is banned for a year or something crazy like that. Well, you know, if you're an honest user and you get then falsely uh, blacklisted, that kind of sucks, right? So having these very strong defenses is great uh, to have them optional if you're under attack. Right, but if everything is all right, uh, maybe you can scale down uh, the active defenses just to have a better user experience for everyone else. Yes, absolutely. Adaptivity is is, is a, a better than to to have it every time, as you mentioned. Yes. Exactly. So hopefully, if all the attackers are listening, uh, don't. It might be easy to attack at first, but we'll ramp up our defenses, and then it will just be boring for you again. So don't even try. <laughs> Hopefully that uh, will be cautious enough. <laughs> uh, so one of the, I guess, most prominent changes in Wasabi 2.0 uh, is, of course, the user interface. And uh, Wasabi 1.0 was uh, pr pretty in its, in its ugliness, um, but 2.0 is really an entirely uh, different beast. Um, what are your thoughts about it? What do you like most? <laughs> Ooh, there are many things and uh, you know the thing that I like is changing through time because the more I use the new software uh, the different part different part that I discover and and uh, getting motivated with but I think the first thing was that for me it was that it's it's beautiful I don't know how to say there are nuances like blurs and uh, rounded corners gradients in the software so it's really i think the engine is is also changed behind so now it it can have more sophisticated animations in it it's not just that you are getting uh, an interface you will get an interface that is interacting with your your sense of beauty <laughs> right it's for example when you start the software and uh, there is the out of the box experience which is uh, some basic information regarding the wallet uh, for the first time in the background you can see that i don't know i think it's a coin that is uh, uh, swimming through the the, the window and this kind of more small nuances is is something that you you get used to but then when you switch back to vv1 for some reason you will see that oh, okay it's it's like a bad dream right coming coming back it it's not i really i don't it's not that i it was wrong or something it was i i know why it's like that but uh it's strictly speaking about the experience it's like like as i mentioned it's like oh i i forget how was it look like before and the, the the difference is is very big the contrast is huge yeah i can echo that you know the, i i was the biggest fanboy of the 1.0 interface it was so nice so detailed uh so you know and, and once you got used to it you could really find a lot of nuances hidden uh, and that was great. Uh, but likewise, you know, now after using the new UI for a couple months, um, I'm kind of ashamed of how bad it is and how much I liked it, uh, the old one. <laughs> yes, it is like your old washing machine, right? It's, it's, it does the job, but 
you have to put some pillows uh, around it because it's very loud and sometimes it's it's uh, leaking the water so uh, but you get used to it right so everybody knows how to use your the old washing machine and and you know what you will get from it so it's very reliable you may even fix it if there is a problem because it's so simple so it's it's robust right but if you buy a new one and you just press a button and everything is working that's and getting back to the old washing machine after that it's uh yeah <laughs> so that that's that's the first thing and uh what else the, the, the wizards there that uh in the new in the in vv1 okay not all the information but information was just put there and if someone was aware what to look for it was just there immediately with one click or or without even clicking to somewhere like for example the coin list you see a, a little check mark you see a shield you see the amount you see the labels uh, we, you provide we provide every information there but uh, you you really have to know where to go and i think this is what you mentioned that if you get used to the software then you can get everything in one click and and it's there and, and that's 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 some kind of advantage but on the other hand if someone is not aware and uh, with 2.0 we are aiming as i mentioned another layer of bitcoin users uh, we could you call them everyday bitcoin users or not over users they they re- need needs a guidance at least at the first time how to do things there so this leads to uh, 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 i don't know a, a feature or, or a, a concept of wizards which i think most of the people have bad memories uh, regarding wizards but we try to make a wizard that is very easy to you just really need to press next 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 so it's kind of the traditional wizard but if you want to change something you can do it but by default it is you can go through the wizard quickly right nobody likes the wizards that has many dialogues there and every page you have to actually do something to being able to to go through so i i like those at the first time i was just ooh uh wizards again yeah there will be many dialogues and basically every dialogue will just show you one piece of information in vv1 i i was just pressing one button and it was everything was there you know it's a different mindset but after after a while i get get why it is important because and and this leads to a concept that if you need to document a software or you need to create a lot of videos regarding the software or you need to have a lot of tooltip or text messages inside the software that means the ux is failing to do what it should the ux should be very intuitive and basically with wizards you can you can do it because there is the let's say the send button so there is a very simple function you want to do you press the send button and afterwards the software is leading you through the steps those are important and and if by selectively you can have extra steps if you want but if you don't want it is only three dialogues as far as i can remember to to actually send the transaction and look vv1 on vv1 you you press the send tab and immediately you will get a bunch of things there coin list the address 
the amount to send, the custom change address, the custom fee, the fee slider, everything was there, but it was overwhelming. So it was like, I don't know what was your uh, uh, order to fill those, uh, fill those fields there, but everybody was using it in a different way. And uh, every and and because it's it's not a problem. The problem is that they used it in a different way, and they wanted to have it in a different way because of their use case was different than the other users. So, if someone asks for a feature, that is because they are using the software, not how it was designed, but because the software is letting to used not by design because everything is there and there is no order of, for example, uh, by of filling the fields there. It leads to, let's say, uh, an interface that is very uh, in chaos, right? But in, in VV2, these wizards are really mitigating and try to uh, I grab the hand of the user and leading through these uh, stressful moments, for example, when you, you have to enter the amount and if you enter a wrong amount, then that's a problem. So we don't need to, we, we don't want to, you, you don't want to put at that page different kind of disturbing things because it will just takes away the focus on very important stuff like the amount and the address where you want to send. So I hope these wizards will be giving more uh, better experience not to stress the user um, by displaying unnecessary information in front. Uh, so th that, that's the other thing what I like at this software. Uh, in, in this VV2 software, the, the wizards. Yes, I noticed this quite a lot uh, because I sat down with many Wasabi users um, and both those that are great Bitcoiners, but were using Wasabi for the first time, uh, but also those who have no idea about Bitcoin, you know, just blind tests of people who've never downloaded a wallet before. And, you know, when you look at them for the very first time, you just see the eyes moving up and down and left and right and all chaotically because everything is all over the place, right? Wallet balances up top, address is down there, then coins up here. And it's just uh, a lot of information shown uh, and not really nice curated, even in the place of where it is. And, and then, of course, that just leads to too to much, right? It's, uh, so I don't think that out of all the hundreds of users that I met in person, um, I don't think there was any one of them who, whom I could just sit in front of his computer, say, download Wasabi and use it and you will be all right and you will get it all. Right? That just doesn't happen. Um, you really needed to sit down and talk step by step about what is the coin list. Now, why do you even need to select something from there if you want to make a payment? You know, all of these, all of these things. Um, and, and basically, we've now made me obsolete. <laughs> you no longer need a guy sitting next to you on the computer, uh, but the software will actually guide you through that process in a similar way that I did before, right? But of course, much better uh, and much more automated. And I think that's that's uh, that's incredibly great for first-time users. Uh, like, I I don't think that can be overestimated of uh, of of how much of an impact this will make for new users, right? Um, and now the big question is, right? Uh, uh, how how does that apply for for users who who know a lot, right? Those who are Bitcoin power users, um, but but even for them, I think you just want to have your problem solved easily, right? You want to send uh, your payment and you want to do it privately in as little mental effort as as reasonable. And one of the really cool um, improvements or one of the cool aspects of having these wizards is that we can change the experience of the wizard based on how the current situation is, right? So one perfect example is if you, so you deposit money into your wallet, right? And you wait a couple of days, everything is nicely mixed. Everything has reached its privacy score. Um, and now you make a payment. Well, uh, you click on send, you see the first screen of the dialogue, right? And you type in your, uh, the amount and the address, right? And then you choose the, 
uh, in the next page, you show uh, the recipient, like, so whom are you actually sending to? Right? But then w the wallet will realize, well, you have private coins in your wallet. Um, uh, nobody knows that they're yours, basically. Uh, and it's enough Satoshi's in those private coins to make this payment. Right? And so, well, uh, I will just auto select uh, from all the private coins, those which will come closest to, to the payment amount. And uh, then we go immediately to the transaction preview screen, right? Because, well, uh, you're private by default. There's, uh, there's nothing that you need to change in order to improve your privacy, basically. It's the, uh, we, we give you the most level of privacy that, that's possible in very little steps, right? And then that's, that's great, you know, for, for everyone, where you can make payments super simply without needing to worry about coin control or whatnot, right? But then in that other scenario where... Um, you don't yet have uh, private coins, right? You have not yet done sufficient coin joins uh, to reach the anonymity score. Uh, then the behavior changes. Right? There, uh, uh, it, it pops up that, hey, we, we cannot make this payment with the desired amount uh, privately. Right? We don't have enough mixed outputs, basically. Uh, so now the user needs to take action and actually tell the software, so which unmixed uh, uh, coin do you prefer? Uh, to, to be used here, right? But again, we can decomplexify and remove the coin list out of this and uh, just handle based on the labels and that information associated with it, right? So the, the actual um, screens that you will see will depend on how your current situation is, right? And if your current situation is optimally private, well, we don't need to bother you with weird things like coin selection, right? Um, uh, but it's still accessible to you in the case that you need it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, automatism is something that for the first time it can be, sounds like uh, uh, a feature that is scary because when we are talking about privacy and security, then these kind of convenience C features like automatic, whatever, sounds a bit dangerous. Uh, at least this is, I experienced this uh, from some users, not everyone, but there were some concerns about this. And, uh, and that's the point that the, the wallet tries to make automatic decisions, but only safe decisions will be made. And if the wallet is not sure what to do, then you will, there will be another dialogue where basically you will get into control in that case. And uh, for example, one feature is that is an automatism inside the software, but I think it's, it's very useful. Just to mention an example. For example, in, in VV1, you had to select the right coins from the list. And personally, what I did is to order the coins in the order of amount, try to find the closest coin to the, the, to the target amount, which is a bit higher, and just send it. So, I will get back the toxic change in that case, which I can, I have to mix again, and also and, and that's enough. That's uh, that's enough problem, right? But in in for example VV2, there is an optional, there is an option, a feature, the changeless coin selector, which basically combines all the coins. And and I I was really struggling because I had a lot of coins because I made a lot of tests on my uh, wallet. I was trying to play with. How can I put together two amounts that it, it is very close to the, to the target? And this was a purely manual, uh, heuristic, uh, from my side that I was trying to combine and see the sum of the coins at the, the bottom of the coin list and, and try to find the closest one and uh, more or less. Okay. I found this. I send it. I still get some change back, but why not? make this, why not suggest the user an automatic uh, uh, 
possible solution or an opportunity to that the software can combine uh, many of these, can run and uh, put together many of these combinations and find the best one, which is the closest to the target using the less coin possible, but you won't get back the toxic change. And this is automatic, right? Because it, it, it's if if you want it, I mean that the calculation is automatic, but then the user will get the the message that there is a way that you can avoid change. You click there, the software will select the coins. You don't need to know about which coins were selected because because those are all private, so you you, you don't actually need that information you will get the what is important that the target amount those are only private coins you get the fee the network fee and that's it you press confirm and now you you are having a let's say a perfect send without getting back a change and i think that's that that's another feature that i i like very much because it is giving me very nice options like this is 0.1 dollar more than the the desired of course i i i will use that uh that combination because i i don't want to get back the change so i don't need to mix so at the end it will be cheaper even if i use more inputs in the transaction i won't get back the change so i don't need to do anything i don't need to to mix again those coins that those are i think more because in that case, you have to pay the network fees, and and that's it. <laughs> because yeah, the coordination fee is another topic that we can dive in uh, later on. But anyway, back to this changeless coin selector feature is is for example really nice. Yeah, it's a really great feature, and you know it it could have worked in Wasabi 1.0 already, and right? you just go through your coin list and find an amount that's close by. But I would argue that in 1.0 um, the it, it would have lurked, worked less in the sense that the discrepancy between the intended amount and the uh, uh, closest changeless amount uh, possible um, would have been much larger. Um, however, right with 2.0, we create these low Hamming weight standard denominations. And what low Hamming weight means, again, is that you can uh, combine a small number of these standard denominations to reach basically any number that you would want uh, to to come up with, right? So because we have all of a sudden in a Wasabi 2.0 wallet, a bunch of these coins that have these uh, uh, standard denominations, well, we've reduced the number of coins that you have to consolidate so that you get exactly the amount that you're looking for substantially, right? So now um, you can actually have, uh, again, less coins uh, and you will still be able to uh, create changeless payments for a much larger range of denominations and without deviating too much from the intended amount versus to uh, to what you actually end up sending right so uh, in in our case now in this testing it's it's very often you know a, a couple sats uh, difference you know well below a dollar worth uh, and this makes this feature really really powerful right because the less utxos you create meaning no change utxo well, the, then you don't have to, first of all, pay for the creation for it, and you don't have to pay when spending uh, this coin, the mining fee, but you also don't have to worry about the future transaction history when you actually spend that change. And so if you don't receive a change, there is nothing to worry about, um, ab about how to spend it in the future. So as you say, that saves you on doing a mix as well, right? After every payment, uh, if you receive change, well, you should do a coin join just for the fact that the person whom you paid then no longer knows the next person that you're going to pay. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, it, it just works very well. Uh, and this is again, right? This is one of the things where we used the coin list previously. So you first select the coins and then you press the max button. And right? very counterintuitive, very weird, uh, kind of a hack. Probably only a small fraction of the users figured out that you can do that and that it's actually beneficial for your privacy. But in 2.0, thanks to this wizard, we can just, you know, throw a small notification. Hey, change your payment amount slightly and you'll benefit. And, and if you click that, well, the warning is gone and it looks green. So you prefer that and you just click next. Not even knowing exactly what's going on or, or, or why it is important, 
but it just works. Uh, not exactly by default, right? Because we're we're the wallet is changing the payment amount that was previously specified. So I don't think that we should do that by default. Um, but uh, at least we notify the user that there is a problem, that there is a way to solve this problem, right? Given the certain trade-offs of sending a little bit more or a little bit less. Yes, exactly. Again, by default we are not going to these options, but we provide and again a one-click solution, right? That's it's something easy to to click on and uh, just to have. Do you want to have change less transaction for zero point one dollar more? You just click on it. The coin is selected, and that's it. So it's it's again a simple user interface, and the, the UI guys in, in the team has a great uh, a huge um, uh, work in this kind of feature. So they are really trying to having user test and try to figure out uh, without compromises how this can be made uh, very simple and very intuitive. And uh, there was a, a debate, for example, regarding the, the tooltips. Uh, should, we, should we display tooltips or should we display text or should we have a little eye icon there where the user can click on or, or display some more information? And basically, in many, many cases, they were even, they were able to break down the problem of um, describing something for the user, break down into, into user interface itself, like adding one more dialogue there to make the things obvious. And I think this strategy works very well because um, I, anyone who is in software development, I think, uh, would uh, agree with this, that users don't read, right? They, if there is a long text, and it's even uh, um, ugly, right? You, you read it once, and the next time you go there, it's, the text is still there. So it, it makes no sense to... So the, the interface should be as intuitive as possible. And, uh, and, and that's that when you start with a bit, this is what, what uh, the UI wants you to feel that, yes, I, I know I, I have to click here. Um, then I want to send, I click the send. And from that point, you go through the wizard. And as you said, there are forks depending on the, the actual situation. Forks where, where they will get a different dialogue or a different way, a path, user path. But all of these paths are just like leading you through the whole process. Yeah, there's really a lot of uh, very in innovative and interesting ideas in the new user interface. And we're still working on it. Uh, and I always find it very fascinating when, when following this work in progress. And, you know, the, the first draft is, is kind of weird uh, it doesn't feel right, right? but it's still okay. Uh, but then after a couple rounds of refactoring, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you move that icon from left to right, and it changes everything. And all of a sudden, it feels really, really good. Um, and I think we've already done massive improvements over the last couple months, uh, now up to the testnet release. And I'm certain we're going to further improve up to the mainnet release and later. Um, but uh, the, yeah, it's 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 really a lot of it's it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of new concepts uh, that we're proposing here um, that might be interesting uh, for for other wallets too. Yes, for example, we were struggling a lot with the fee. How to set the fee rate for a transaction without saying fee rate or satoshi per V byte. Right, because if we are talking about Satoshi per V-byte, this is a rabbit hole that it leads to to a vortex of information. And but but still, we we know a lot of information regarding the fee rate and the current fee environment. So how how to 
how to communicate the fear rate without speaking about the fear rate, you know, and and every time we get back that yes, we should display the Satoshi per V byte. But but we, we know that road. We already did it in VV1 and it was not so good. The other solution would be to have this fast or cheap, right? It's a scroll bar or, or medium priority, low priority, medium high. That's just that it will have predefined predefined values there and okay, confirm, make the confirmation in one hour or in, in a day or in three days, right? So it's, it's uh, not so advanced. So that, for example, if you go to us, and what, what we did is actually that we, we had a, a, f a chart there. And, and what's the nuance? The, the nuance that we, the user usually want is to where, or if it is urgent, then you will just send quickly, right? We are talking about a case when it is urgent, but you want to make it as quick as possible, but also the economically the best choice there, right? There, there are many situations and, and you go to, one of the the fee providers there or like uh, the block blockchain information and you try to figure out heuristically uh, yes the next block has an average of 22 satoshi per v byte so i will send 23 right or something like this but if, if it is about 100 then you will say no this is too much i won't send the transaction now or I don't know, whatever. So we decided to, to pick a, a default value there, I think, which is the quickest confirmation possible or something like this. I, I don't remember, but there is a default choice. But then if it is not good because uh, the user see that this is $4, for example, so I want to change it, then the user will have a a chart where basically he, he will be able to decide where is a breakdown uh, in the fees uh, versus time. So there is always a breakdown there if you, if you uh, encountered with this because the first, okay, let's say that we are in a heavy uh, fee environment. So uh, the, the short time periods are, are very expensive. But after a while, there is a, a curve uh, there where basically the transaction became, became cheap, but it's also the quickest, uh, which is not in the expensive area. So there is a step function, let's say a step there. And if the user wants to be very clever, he can be because he just so see this this uh, chart, which is not lineal usually, as I mentioned, there is always one step there where, where the transaction became cheap. Uh, but still, you don't need to choose the, the lowest, like the three weeks confirmation period. So you get the information without having to deal with Satoshi per V byte, right? It's and basically it doesn't matter uh, the satoshi per v byte what matters for the user how can i make an economic decision there and with this chart you will be able to do that so that was like this software is full of these kind of small uh, ids where basically it's really focusing on the information not the technical and helping the user to make the decision the easiest way without knowing these phenomenons from Bitcoin itself. But I'm, I'm sure that if you, I, I'm sure that uh, the UI team can, can talk about this, these kind of things more deeply and maybe they can, they can put behind some user stories, how they are getting to this because I think they are doing it for more than a year or something close. So they are really iterating, 
through these kind of interfaces, uh, why they made this kind of decision. I was involved some of it, of course, but uh, and, and it was interesting that what is the perspective of different people, different Bitcoin users, how they uh, approach the problem itself. And, you know, developers usually approach it in a way that it will it would lead to VV1 because they want to see everything on the same page and they are lazy. <laughs> but uh, but uh, other users just just blocked by this approach because they are scared of this kind of interface. And this is okay. I mean, this is the, the user that we are aiming for. We are not writing the software for ourselves. We are writing the software for for people. There are two things here, right? Because for one, the the actual information uh, needed to make a decision itself, right? And that is the Satoshis per V-byte and what a mempool is uh, in these things. And if the user has all of this information and he understands what they mean, that, then he can map his own preferences of how fast do you want to get confirmed to an actionable result of set five sets per V-byte for this specific transaction, right? But uh, and this is how Wasabi 1.0 worked uh, to some extent, right? The user was confronted with the different fee rates itself. Um, however, uh, we can do that differently by asking the user um, not about the specifics uh, of how many sats per V-byte do you want to send, right? Or not even displaying these, these units to him, but rather we just show him the information um, of how how much, relatively speaking, does a confirmation within the next block cost or uh, within the next day or week or month, right? And you, you you see then the relative cost. And as you say, there's going to be this inflection point where if you get a little bit faster than a day, you're going to pay a lot more in fees. And that is ultimately what the user cares about, right? And now he can give us that preference of, I want to get uh, confirmed um, in, a, in a day, because that's where it doesn't cost that much, right? So sooner would cost a lot more. Um, he, he can now give us that preference. And now Wasabi can map the actual user preference to the underlying fee rate in sats per V-byte that we need to make an action upon for every transaction, right? But the user doesn't need to know the nuanced information. Uh, um, uh, and, and he just needs to know enough information to give us a preference and then with that preference, Wasabi can try to realize that uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, and as you say, these types of tricks are, I think, all over in the new Wallet UX, and that's great. And it also shows that having these wizards is, is crucially important, because if we would have put this transaction fee graph into the Wasabi 1.0 send page, or send tap, right? Then it would have been yet another piece of information that is shown by default for every single user. And, and that would just lead to clutter and confusion um, because some people might not even know what this, you know, why this is shown. Uh, however, in 2.0, with having these wizards and the wallet guiding you step by step through the process, well, first of all, by default, we might not even have to show this. And we just remember, for example, what, what, what was the fee time chosen previously, uh, and we apply that, you know, some sane default. Um, however, if the user wants to see this information and actually wants to give us his preference in a concrete way, then he can open this additional window. Right? And in the next page of the wizard, there is a dedicated full screen that just shows this transaction graph nice and big and focused. And so now the user knows that he actually, uh, or why he's seeing this, because he said, please change the fee um, or, or speed up the transaction, basically. So he has context of what this graph actually is, uh, and therefore it's it's a lot more useful for him, right? And it can be nice and big. Um, uh, so this just really shows that uh, this, this great power of having that wizard that can adapt and show different screens to different users depending on the problem that they are currently interacting and, and how deeply they want to work around it. Yes, that, that's very good points. Yes, maintaining the focus of the user is, is something that VV1 did not care about at all. 
yeah, very different design philosophies between Wasabi 1.0 and 2.0, especially in the UI. Uh, and next week on the show, I will be talking with Dan Wellmsley, uh, the uh, uh, UI chief <laughs> of, of Wasabi. Uh, and he, he will surely have a lot more nuances and interesting ideas. Um, so we will get to, into the UI much more in the future. Um, but for now, uh, I think, David, we covered a whole bunch of ground uh, and it gave a lot of the reasoning. Um, is is there anything else that we were missing? Anything that you want to bring up? Uh, I think it was enough. There are many other topics, like for example, the Wabi Sabi protocol, which is the 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 framework of the new coin join, right? But it's a, I think it's a a, a whole other episode, and maybe. Maybe Lucas can talk about that uh, in details uh, more. But uh, yes, that's another. Uh, I think we we went through all the uh, the most prior things like comparison between the, just picking out the the most important changes and uh, the reasons why it was made. They were made so. I don't have any more topics for today. Well, then, David, it's time to say one more time thank you for all the work you do, uh, because seriously, Wasabi would not be here today uh, without you. Uh, I've been uh, some major and very important uh, part of the project. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, lots of users are thankful, uh, I'm sure, as well. And thanks for coming on the podcast. It was nice to chat again uh, and to dive down these nuances. I hope this was valuable for the users too, and they understand some more of our rationale uh, behind these reckless and, and, and weird changes that we're doing with 2.0. Uh, they're hopefully well contemplated and thought through uh, by great minds like David. Um, but as anyway, right, give us your feedback. Um, this, this is why we have this testing uh, review candidate right now um, to, to make sure that uh, what we came up with is not completely crazy. Uh, if it is, tell us. Uh, if it's kind of brilliant, tell us too. Uh, but please be active uh, because now is the time to still, um, you know, make changes uh, before we actually ship it for good uh, on mainnet uh, for, for the crazy people. So, um, David, thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having me and thank you for your attention. And uh, we are, every contribution is very warmly welcomed there. So keep it up. Thank you. And for everyone else, uh, see you on the next one.